Hello, welcome to the Musty Monday, and thank you all for joining us this evening as we speak with Stephanie McCarty with Taylor Morrison Homes, and um, we're going to talk a little bit about strategic communications and public relations and the ever-changing role as we're seeing a lot of things change um, in 2020 and how to prepare for 2021. Stephanie, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Thank you for having me. It's so great to be here. I wish I could be in person with all of you. To be back, really back. Well, that's why I did the virtual background is so yeah. you can kind of feel yeah. like you're, you're, you're back. back at Cronkite. Yeah. Um, if you don't mind, I would like to share a little bit about you to our sure. audience, and then we'll get started with the questions and um, actual program. Um, for those of you who do not know Stephanie, she is um, a, a proud Cronkite alumna, um, and she's also the Chief Marketing and Communications Officer at Taylor Morrison, which is one of the largest home builders in the United States. Um, Stephanie joined Taylor Morrison back in 2015 and was quickly promoted after three years um, to the Chief Marketing and Communications Officer after she transformed the company culture and the brand nationwide. In her role, Stephanie leads consumer marketing, executive and employee communications, public relations, um, issues management, crisis management, um, and I'm sure a host of other things that aren't even in that list. Um, Stephanie has also held positions at very large organizations in Arizona, such as the University of Phoenix, Insight, On Semiconductor, and also McMurray, serving in various communication roles. Um, and she's also been a recipient of several industry awards, including Top Women in Communications and Top Women in PR. Stephanie is a mother of two small children, ages five and two, right? Five and two? Five. Five and two, almost three in January. Oh my goodness. So she's got her hands full, um, but when she's not working and chasing the little ones, she does enjoy reading, uh, biking, hiking. Um, she's a proud Peloton owner and um, finds the workouts to be stress relieving and also provide clarity before the work week. So thank you so much, Stephanie, for being here and coming back to Cronkite to lend some of your insights and experiences. I know our students really value it. Yeah, my pleasure, thank you. Thank you. Um, so we will have questions and answers at the end of our discussion. So um, make sure you jot those down and we will address them at the end. And um, I know a lot of times the students have questions in regard to careers, um, interviews and starting their, their uh, PR career. So we'll talk a little bit about that um, later. but. It's been a crazy year for many different reasons. I'm sure you would agree. Um, and there's been a lot of dialogue around, um, you know, what needs to change. And um, there's a tremendous, a, a, there's a tremendous amount of work to be done. And strategic communicators and public relations professionals have a huge opportunity to make an impact and guide others to do the same. Um, including mega brands. Yep. And so today we're going to talk about that, how you reimagine um, the brand, the culture, how you communicate to your internal audiences and external audiences. But before we jump into that, Stephanie, I wanted to just go over some definitions because not all of our students know brand versus culture versus PR. So how would you describe brand communications and how it falls within strategic communications? It's a really good question. I think if I were to define brand communications, I would think it's the relationship that the brand has with consumers. So it's how a, an individual feels about a certain product or a brand. So much of that is done through messaging and communications. Um, it's all about really emotives. You know, how do you make people feel? And then how about the company culture and how is it intertwined with the brand? Because they are so symbiotic. They are. And I think most um, chief marketing officers feel like they are responsible for the brand and how the brand is perceived externally, how do consumers feel about it? How does that drive sales? I think the benefit of coming up really through strategic communications and more on the internal side is um, a brand is built from within. 
a brand is, you know, ultimately a, a collection of people um, from a variety of different experiences and backgrounds. And that brand is typically divine, defined by that employee experience, which then in turn provides a customer experience. So starting my career really in-house on the employee side, um, it's also culture is really about how, you, what your relationship is with your employer or your relationship with, you know, your school, the culture within the Cronkite um, school is one that's created by the people who are there who are serving that organization. So that's, um, cultures can be, can be defined by many, but it's really lived by all. Um, and I feel communicators have a very, it's not really defined, but the communication team ultimately drives how people feel about their employer. I mean, the way you communicate, what you communicate about sends a very strong message to what's important, what's really like rooted in the values of that organization. And as the communicator, you know, you're kind of the creator and the keeper of that culture. Um, so you have, I mean, you're really, you influence it every day with every word you choose to put out there in front of your audience. So I think culture and brands you might be just different stakeholders that you're talking about, but it's really one and the same. So you work very closely with human resources too, I imagine. Very, very closely, yes, yeah. They're really, I would say, the ones that help execute the brand and reinforce. Um, I think marketing communications team can create the vision, um, help um, executives, I guess, find the words and articulate the vision around a culture or a brand and what they want to stand for and help influence it. Um, but HR really helps to execute it, right? Because the behaviors that you reward, the behaviors that get, you know, ultimately reprimanded speak louder than any pretty words you can put out there. Um, so they say actions speak louder than words. HR and human resources really help to execute and help um, keep the culture that you define really there. Yeah, that relationship is so important. So in regard to reimagining the brand and the culture, how has the role of communications and PR professionals been impacted by the events of 2020 and how have they responded? And if you have some examples, that would be great too. Yeah, what I think the pandemic did for brands and for communicators is it really accelerated what I think a lot of us have known and felt for a while. Um, is consumers expect more from brands. Employees accept, expect more from employers. It's not simply a paycheck. When you go to work, you expect your employer to care about your well-being. You expect your employer to provide a safe space, be maybe empathetic. Um, they, want to, they want to know how their executives feel about maybe um, some device divisive topics right you know executives used to only have to communicate about strategy and goals and how to get there people in in 2020 expect ceos to have a stance on social injustice politics and they no longer have to just worry about the bottom line and making a return to their shareholders they have so many different stakeholders that they have to be communicating to and so 2020 i think has has helped us, I think in my personal um, work, push our executives even more into that unknown zone, that discomfort of finding their voice and finding their stance on a number of topics that I think in the past have been just no zones. You just don't talk about that where, you know, your employer, employees wanna know who they're working for, what their beliefs are how they view certain things. Consumers, that conscious consumer, I think we've been hearing about that for a while. Now, when they're at home, they have more time to do research on brands. A lot of the statistics and research I'm finding, you know, they, a lot of people are switching brands right now because yeah. they want to, they want to buy from a brand who stands for something that they, that's similar to their values. Um, so as a, brand communicator as a marketer you have to find ways to relate to consumers on levels that it's not just about sales it's really you know connecting at the core of who you are and what that business stands for um you know in politics this year has been 
an underlying, it's been kind of an issue, masks all of a sudden are a political thing. And your stance on George Floyd and how you respond to diversity and inclusion is somewhat political. And so being the message creator and writer, you know, we've had to really find like this delicate place of how do you create a safe space in the midst, in the midst of that? How do you have a message that, you know, you're hopefully not going to offend people? Um, you know, I don't, we don't work, I don't work in California. I don't work for, you know, Nike, who has no problem putting Colin Kaepernick, in, you know, as the face of their brands, knowing that that's probably going to offend a lot of people who don't agree with his views and his behaviors. Um, Taylor Morrison is a brand, isn't a brand willing to take that kind of a stand, but we've had to take stands and be more public around certain things. Um, and I think it's just expected. I think a lot of you probably saw brands that you work with or purchase from all the time have an opinion around diversity and inclusion, not long after George Floyd. Taylor Morrison did. Um, you know, we had a big message around there's no, there's no home for racism at Taylor Morrison. Um, and so we had to go out there and be pretty bold. Um, but in that moment, we also had many people look at us and say, well, show us a picture of your board of directors, right? How many black Americans, Indian Americans do you have on your board? We have great gender diversity, but we don't have. So I think every brand was kind of at the, you know, you're at the mercy of the public um, for what you're doing wrong and what you're not doing. Um, so I think for me, it's really been accelerating what we've already believed in. And it gave us a platform to really push it um, forward. On the marketing side, I think we took the opportunity to really transform our digital innovation, how to reach people more online to purchase a home um, and do it a lot faster. I think we've been long talking about internally, like how do we create a platform that allows people to purchase homes online? Um, new home construction is a lot different than resale. So how do you assemble your home just like you would assemble your Tesla or your BMW online and check out? Um, the, the pandemic allowed us to accelerate that because consumers are now, that's how they're shopping. Um, so that's really been driving a lot of our focus for the last eight months. And to be honest, Lisa, I've never been in, you know, the 14 years I've been in the professional world, I've never been so busy. Yeah. It, the pandemic hit and I immediately had to put my crisis communications hat on and you just have to hit, hit every stakeholder. I mean, we were communicating to employees two, three, four times a week, every week for the first three months while people were figuring out what does this mean? I can't come to work. How do I do my job? Um, to homeowners, to, to prospective you know, prospects who are trying to buy a home. Mm -hmm. um, so crisis communications was like nonstop for the first five months. You know, Also leading the marketing team, it was, oh no, people can't come into our models and our showrooms. How are we going to sell homes? Um, and everything funneled through the website, which my team manages. So how are we going to sell homes online? So we had to pivot and rethink our entire strategy for marketing and communications and all the messaging that we had really pre-thought through for the year. All of that was thrown out the window and we really started over. That's so interesting. I mean, a few things that you said really stuck out. Um, so you started selling homes online during the pandemic. Yeah, so we, um, we've always done more of like kind of a hybrid. You can take like virtual tours online. Those have always kind of existed. But what we find is people would explore a little online and then they'd want to go see it. Why wouldn't you? Um, why wouldn't you want to walk through a, a model of a beautiful home and either want to buy it or at least get design ideas, right? On how you want to remodel your kitchen. When our sales office is closed, you couldn't do that. So we had to create more opportunity online for people to get all the information they need. Um, and then we created options because inventory, I think, you know, sales went down for a moment while people were like, oh my gosh, am I going to have a job? And then I'd say like late April, um, interest rates are so low. All of a sudden they've been in their house for six weeks and they're thinking, I'm not set up to work here, to teach my kids here, to work out here, to do everything here. I need a bigger house or I need a different orientation of a house. I need an extra room. Um, so people were moving like crazy. 
Um, and so inventory was really low. So we created a way online where you could reserve homes. We have inventory homes too, which is a, a ready, a, a move-in ready home. Um, we created self-guided tours. So you could go to an inventory home and tour it yourself, which pre-COVID, a salesperson would never want someone to go tour by themselves. They mm -hmm. want to help. They want to be there. They want to get the deal. Um, and now we're letting people in our homes all by themselves. It's safe. They're not getting the pressure of a sales associate. So the technology to be able to do that, we had to think really quickly. And then the website had to enable people to be able to do that. Yeah, when you said it escalated like really quickly, and that's not an easy thing to pull off technically either, right? No. To, to build a different, a, a different type of website yeah. and engagement with your consumer where your touch points are usually physical, but still carrying out your brand, right? And the culture. Um, something, another thing that you said is interesting and important to point out in that communications professionals, a lot of the time will handle operations. And so you get called into, okay, this is broken. We need to fix the operational part and then we can market it and talk about it. Um, but a lot of what you described is operations, mm -hmm. right? So you kind yeah. of wear a COO hat at times as well. Well, and I think pre-pandemic, I'll, I'll say even pre-chief marketing officer role, say vice president of communications or director of, of communications at University of Phoenix, a typical request will come in and they'll be like, we need communication support. We need you to write this for this audience. And you come to the table and you're like, okay, I have to understand it in order to write about it, walk me through it. And that's when you're going through it and you're like, oh, that doesn't really make sense. The audience isn't gonna get it. What if you did X, Y, and Z and you become not only an operator, you're a problem, a business problem solver. Yeah. You're, 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 you know, you're trying to take a, a complex issue and boil it down into a concise, clear message that people are gonna understand. And nine times out of 10, you are working on how do you make the process more efficient? And how do you make this um, an easier message to absorb? And a lot of that goes into um, efficacy and process improvement within the organization. But I think that's actually a really important role for a communicator to get the opportunity to do it because then you're not only viewed as you know, an order taker. I talk to my team all the time as if someone comes to you and says, hey, I need a message for this, I need it by this day. You know, we're not going to say, would you like fries with that? We say, um, let's really think through that. I'll be the strategic communicator. I'll put the communication plan and timeline around that. That actually fits with all the other organizational communication announcements that are going on that you're not aware of, right? How do I fit your important message into this other narrative that's already, already exists? So you become this communication council, but a very successful and strategic business person. And I think when you can have both of those hats, the way the role is viewed within the organization morphs into something that is not a nice to have, it's a must have. I think a lot of my friends, I got in, you know, I graduated in 2007 and I started working in the middle of the recession. You know, I um, took my first in-house job at on semiconductor and four months into it, people were getting furloughed. We were closing fabs. I jumped into crisis communications and how do you make people feel? And I think crisis communications and being a part of an organization, at that time, I was afraid of you know, losing my job. Um, and ever since then in 2008, and I made sure that I was always gonna be relevant and my work would always matter, um, I've never actually been afraid to be let go. Um, because I think in times of crisis, in times of significant change, there is no better job security um, than being in the communications profession because people don't know how to approach that stuff the way we do. Mm -hmm. If you can see a story and you know how to tell it and you know how to relate to people and you can connect those two and you can find that voice, it's a talent that you know, a lot of people think they're writers. A lot of people think they're communicators and they're really not. And once the organization sees that, it's, it's so tough to, to let it go. Yeah. Yeah. And also when you were talking about all those pieces that happen behind the scenes, it's also how does that trickle down then 
through the brand and the culture when consumer like does it match do the stories match does operations and the story and the messaging you're trying to convey match the actual interaction with your consumers and you know years ago it used to be that the only experience a consumer had was the one that they physically had yeah where now you have all these digital means where you can share reviews and feedback and have a whole dialogue with millions of people watching, you know, real time. And so that, that has also impacted the industry significantly. Um, yeah, so the internet, and now you don't, you, there's a lot more out there to control and to influence as it relates to your brand. And I think you made a really good point because I have a strong, I like in my core and in everything that I believe in, in this profession, a brand is built from the inside out if your employees don't believe it and employees are the first to sniff out any bs right they are the ones who are there every day if any of you have ever worked anywhere right you know when you get an email from the ceo and it's all hunky dory kumbaya and you're like no that's not how it is here you're clueless um your employees are the ones who are going to tell you the truth and if you listen and you act on that you know then they become your brig your biggest brand ambassadors and it's a lot easier to push it out to consumers and have them believe it. You know, a lot of CMOs focus on how do consumers feel, and then they try to force that in on the employees, and it never works, it never works that way. So when you first got to Taylor Morrison, I think you were saying it was a team of two. So I'm assuming you did not adopt this magical culture and brand. It did not exist, although it was probably a great organization, but you had to build it. So can you can you share with us a little bit of about how you built it and then how you maintain this brand that continues to reimagine what could be and not continually push out the same? Yeah. No. So I, when I started in 2015, it was a team of two of us and um, Taylor Morrison was much smaller. Uh, we had maybe eight or nine divisions. We now have 22 divisions across the country. So. Taylor Morrison is kind of a mashup of multiple acquisitions and mergers. So since I started, we've done six acquisitions. Um, and it was very entrepreneurial, right? Every division kind of existed within its own four walls. And they didn't worry about, if I'm in Phoenix, I don't really care about what's happening in the Bay. That's their business. This is my business. And that division had a culture, right? Just like every team has its own culture and then, you know, subcultures. and as we knew the strategy was to grow as a company that we were going to have to start breaking down those geographical walls and connect people from across the country and help them understand that they're part of something bigger so we really started with the foundation of just what tools what channels do you need to create so that if i'm sitting in sacramento and i'm a construction superintendent and there's someone in Sarasota doing the same job. How can I relate to them and their experiences? How do you share best practices? So we really focused on, you know, creating the heart of the organization where all the storytelling would take place. And it would be our daily news channel, if you will, right? And it would be complete corporate journalism, right? This is not where you issue a public memo about benefit open enrollment. This is telling the stories of the people and how they engage with others and doing it in a way that people expect to do it on their own time, right? How it interacts and engages just like Facebook, right? Where you can leave comments, where you can like comments. So it was really creating the infrastructure that showed people, hey, you're part of a, lot, a much larger organization. In doing that and creating all these channels, we created a video blog for the CEO, which really showed her as this human who comes in, you know, sometimes with her dress not zipped up all the way and, and, and you know, just like all of us armpit on her, you know, or um, deodorant on her dress or lipstick on her teeth. And it humanized her. Um, we created kind of this cadence of communications because we didn't have it. Everything was driven within those four walls of that ge geographic location. Um, so that broke down a lot of barriers. And then we said, as we continued to grow, it's a lot easier when you go into an acquisition if you know who you are and you know what to say to that incoming company. 
hey, we're so happy for you to be a part of Taylor Morrison. This is what it means to be part of the Taylor Morrison family. And so when I sat down and asked the team of executives, like, what does it mean to you to work here? We got a ton of answers. And so we went out to the employees and we crowdsourced and we asked people to submit videos. You know, what's your favorite part about working here? Why do you work here? From that, we essentially boil down what we call our tenants and our manifestos. Why do people come to work here? What does it mean to work here? What are our values? We didn't, we didn't have you know, a larger organization come in and say, You're, these are your values. Our people defined what the values were. From there, we created, you know, how do you put a big bow around a corporate culture? What do you call it? How do you get people to rally around it and get excited about it? Um, so we went through that work and it took a good 18 months. And through that, I think we did one acquisition and we're on to the next one. And we felt that having that message very clear, having a communication channel where we talked about that culture every day was a uh, non-negotiable. So it was really creating the foundation and all of that, um, those channels to allow us to keep that um, dialogue going with employees was you know, critical. Once we've done it now, people, people, and I fought operators on some of these channels. They're like, oh, we don't need that. No one will read it. No one will go to that. And now, you know, two years, three years, four years later, they're like, I can't even remember what this place was like without all this. It's such a big part of our DNA now. So when new employees come in and they just don't know any different, and certainly in our sector, communications is not something that we're known for. So when they come to Taylor Morrison, it's very incestual. So home building, you know, go, you go from one builder to the next and they'll be the first to tell you they do not communicate like this. They're not that transparent. They don't have as many touch points. They don't tell the human interest pieces. You just don't feel that connection to your employer. If you go on our glass store, you know, every, I think every company gets, you know, a negative review because experiences are very personal. Um, largely you you see oh my gosh i heard about the culture i thought it was it couldn't be true then i got there it really is true what they say is who they are um and you can't let that go because you do have to maintain it because if you're not constantly shaping it and driving it someone else will tell that story so we have a daily communication it's called the huddle um and we issue them a week in advance every morning Every employee is, is talking about the same two or three messages for the day across the organization. doesn't matter where you sit. There's a wow story. There's some sort of customer experience. We talk about a tenant. We apply it to real world scenarios every day. So you're almost indoctrinated into this is who we say we are and this is how we live it. Um, and a lot of really big organizations, it's a lot harder to do. We have about 3000 employees and it's already a little bit getting unmanageable, um, but it's so important that, you know, we've got three or four internal communication specialists and managers, and their whole job is making sure that we've got content, we've got stories, and we're showcasing how we live these values and live these tenants every day. Well, that's so important too, for a year like this year, to have that foundation where you already know who you are. You're not in that awkward, like teenage phase of like, yes. I'm not sure what we believe. I'm not sure what we think. Every, you know, instance and experience will differ and there's a large area of variance. Yep. Um, so I would assume that, you know, although still crisis, addressing some of the issues that you guys had to address this year um, came from a really great foundation that you had already built. It did. And then likewise, I took over the marketing function two years ago, two years ago, last month. Um, and I think even our marketing was very decentralized and across markets, how we were perceived and how we showed up was different. So we centralized a lot of um, the brand marketing assets, you know, creative, the messaging, so that it doesn't matter where you are, a customer is going to get the same experience. But last year we did our first real um, national brand campaign where we went out there with, hey, this is who we are. This is what we stand for. We have a very prominent message around progression that, you know, we're here for every stage of your life. As you progress, as you take that big leap into the unknown, like Taylor Morrison would be there. 
Um, and so we spent a lot of time talking to consumers around what that means to them. And so we went out with this very emotional campaign around our brand purpose. And again, as if we could have timed it any better, had we not done that, when we went out, because our big tagline last year was make moves, you know, make moves. And then this year we made, we did a, a huge brand act and it's every, you know, PR practitioner's dream. You know, we, we decided as a result of COVID, people now care more about their environment. They're going to be more health conscious. They want to live in a home that's got great air filtration, great water filtration, chemical free paint, things that just help them feel safer. And so as an organization, we decided we were going to do all of those things. We were going to put a number of products in our home standard at no additional cost to the consumer. It doesn't change the price of the home. These are just things consumers deserve to have. They need to feel safe at home. Operationally, it was a nightmare to try to do it internally. We got there, but it was really hard. But from a marketing perspective, last year it was make moves. This year it's make healthier moves, right? And we're talking about how at Taylor Morrison, all of this is standard. Home is more than where the heart is. It's where all of you is. So we take care of all of you at Taylor Morrison. So that marketing message and that commitment was so much easier to build on because we built that infrastructure last year. Um, and so the consumer didn't see this message out of nowhere that they were like, oh, they must have hired a really expensive agency to help them get this right, but it doesn't tie or, or connect to anything else they've said about themselves. So that infrastructure, again, I didn't have a crystal ball. We didn't know what, what 2020 would bring, but we certainly took the appropriate steps in the last few years to really set ourselves up for success, both from a strategic communications perspective and a brand marketing perspective. So if you did have a crystal ball, I guess looking, looking forward, how are you going to continue to evolve, um, you know, into to 2021 and reimagine? Is this something that you'll do in annual planning or you'll con consistently, um, I guess, engage just as things happen or quarter by quarter? How does someone plan or an org organization plan to evolve and reimagine for the next year? Well, I think doing annual plans was already really hard to do pre-pandemic. Yeah, It's now become basically impossible, right? There was nothing that happened this year that we had planned for. Um, I think that's just from a marketer or communications. You can't, I mean, we're a service department. We are here to serve the business. So the business has to lead Half the time communicators will find, you know, you're trying to lead the business or pull them to do one thing or, or the other. And sometimes you're successful and sometimes you're not. Um, but from a PR perspective, you know, we make up a lot of really great ideas and pitch it to the organization. Say, well, if you did this, we could tell this really great story. Um, can we get your commitment? So we're, we're committed to looking at our plan essentially quarterly, Lisa, like you said. Plan for what you can as far into the future as you can. And I think to, in today's reality, that's really three months. Um, but from an internal communications or strategic communications role, work is going to look different. Our workforce is not going to be together 100% of the time ever again. So, um, you know, your town halls, you're going to have to create, te use technology use different ways of connecting with people because people aren't always going to be together. I think that's going to be a permanent structural change in corporate America, probably for the better. And I think from a communications person, I've always had the opportunity to work from home here or there. Um, Cause I, as long as I have my laptop, I can essentially do my job from anywhere. I have a big creative team full of graphic designers and, you know, they can work anywhere. Um, I'm not a construction superintendent. Like I clearly, if I was a superintendent, I need to be on site. Um, but I think the world's just going to look differently. So communicating to, 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 you know, team members who are not all together creates its own opportunity to think about how you communicate differently. Consumers are going to engage with the brand differently. Um, so we're very focused on the online customer experience. How do they engage with us um, differently? The different technology we've created on our website, we now have new trends and new things to analyze. How do how are people engaging with us online? 
um, which is going to change our retargeting efforts. How do we come after those people who leave us? We now, because we have the reserve your home online option, we have what lots of brands have, but um, shopping cart abandonment, right? People will put a home in their shopping cart and not check out. And we have to go, well, wait, did you forget something? Did you forget something? Your, your $500,000 house that you wanted to buy is sitting on the shelf. Don't miss out on it. Um, so that's something as a home builder marketer, like we've never had to think through. So the whole world as we know it um, has changed. But what I think that means for students is you're not gonna enter any workforce with a playbook already created for you. You get to create it in real time, which is something I've had the um, opportunity to do at every organization I've come to. It's almost been uh, at ground level, right? They didn't have you know, a 10 person communications team and I was coming in and just filling a seat. They've been pretty small and they're kind of reinventing themselves or the brand is going through some sort of change. I think it was funny as a senior at ASU, I bought this book around change communications, you know, and it's very focused on transactional. This thing is changing. How do you communicate that? My whole world for the last 14 years has been change communications and there hasn't been a book written about it that could have prepared me for that. If it's not a divestiture or a merger or an acquisition or a CE, a leadership change or a process change, a process improvement, a strategy shift, every day is change communication that um, we could rewrite those books. Um, but I think it's really, it's an exciting time for communicators because everything's new. And I think coming out of school fresh, you're not gonna fit into any mold. You're gonna create, you're gonna shatter the mold and recreate what corporate communication means as every kind of new generation enters the workforce and new communications professionals enter the workforce. It's all gonna be happening at the same time. Yeah. You had mentioned storytelling a couple times. Um, a lot of our students, as you know, are storytellers. Yes. We talk a lot in PR about media relations so you create this culture, this brand, um, or a new offering, and you wanna get the word out. How are you communicating it externally? What type of platforms are you guys using to share your story? So we do a lot of pitches too. Um, social media is obviously, there's a lot of organic ways to get your own message out. If it's an owned channel, right? You can go kind of push your own message out. But but earned media and um, PR is still, you know, probably the hardest part of my job. Um, reporters are one, extremely busy, two, extremely lazy, um, and, and three, you know, trying to find, you know, a unique story. So as a PR practitioner, our jobs continue to get increasingly harder to break through the noise, have a really compelling story, be personalized, time it right. I mean, it really is like this science and art um, of doing it. And you just have to have a story. Otherwise, the reporter, you're just wasting their time and your own time. Um, so a lot of it's really pressure testing with the organization and with ourselves, right? Do we just think this is really cool? Or, you know, is this really going to resonate outside? Um, and the hardest part, I think, Lisa, in the last few years is there's so much turnover on the reporter side. Yeah. You have, you know, you build a relationship with a reporter at the New York Times. She's either in your beat or she's a freelance and you know, you break through, you have a great call, you introduce her to, you know, a senior executive, they have a great call. You're crossing your fingers that something's written. It is or it isn't. Then you have another great story to pitch and you go to pitch and they're not there anymore. Yeah. I mean, reporters used to be there for decades. And now you're we're chasing down new reporters at the same outlets you know, every quarter. So it becomes really hard to, to find your, find your way through it. So every time it happens, it's a victory. And are you partnering the earned media with paid strategies? To yes. Yeah. 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 I think having both really amplify each other. Um, I don't think you can be as effective if you don't have those kind of simultaneously working together. Yeah. Yeah, we were just talking about pitches today. Our, our students were pitching on behalf of a client and we were talking about what makes for the perfect pitch. Um, and definitely we said short, shorter is better. Bullet points, 
bolding subject line is super important yes. and just making it easy for your journalist friends you know yeah. like they're a partner in the storytelling yeah. and so if they have to come back and ask five questions for you to respond and go back and forth yeah. that's yeah. not yeah. efficient you've lost them it's not efficient for them and a lot of them are wearing multiple hats too yeah. and doing um you know more than ever before exactly. um so moving forward i guess and you kind of touched on this a little bit but um in regard to what companies can do if there's two things that a company should be doing right now to reimagine what should they put into consideration well i think they should ask um their people one i hope to god that they were communicating often during the pandemic um and that they were being empathetic and they were asking people for feedback um, on what they do. Genuine, genuine, genuine feedback, yeah. right? Because we've all gotten those emails from companies too, where they're just, we were talking about it when the pandemic first hit, we got email from a brand about the gym. Like there's never been a better time to come to the gym and sweat it out or whatever. And we're thinking, no, we're in the middle of a quarantine. Not now, maybe not now. So it was just like a thoughtless, like everyone reach out to everyone. Yeah. Type well, it was this weird ethos, I think, that we found ourselves in where, you know, I think every brand you've ever subscribed to, you got an email saying, here's our response to COVID, yeah. right? You got every brand trying to do their part. And then people got so sick of hearing about COVID that the, you almost went into this dream phase where brands were trying to distract you and make you not think about the pandemic or not be sad and and be empathetic and so it's like every brand kind of went through this like wild ride together and you were getting like the same you know you could take swap the brand names out where you were getting the same message so it was really hard i think even then for brands to stand out um so there was a lot of i think trial and error going on what what resonates what doesn't where are people um in this journey um because i think some people moved through it a little bit faster than others but I think for a brand, two things that I would consider is one, you know, talking to your, your people, getting, getting a real clear understanding of how people feel either about your brand as a consumer, about you as an employer, as an employee. Um, and, you know, try to find a way, I think, to adapt as, well, as your business operations will allow um, and how you say, oh, your safety is of the utmost important to us. You know, if you're going to say make stance like that, you, know, you have to really be able to back it up. Um, I think every communicator I've worked for a dozen CEOs who want to say one thing, but don't live up to that. And, you know, it's really, it becomes really increasingly harder as a communicator to write that message because you know, it's not true. Um, so I think a lot of it's too really challenging your executive teams to think differently and be the voice of you know your employees the voice of your consumers i think if you can't do that as a communications a strategic communicator or marketer like you're not really doing your job i i, I had this brief moment early on in my career where i felt well i'm an executive communicator my my job is to deliver the message of the executives and that mentality for me was really hard when i worked with you know, colleagues every day. And very quickly, I realized that my job is actually to marry what CEOs think is reality and what employees say is reality and be the voice of team members for the executives and find a way to bring their message to employees in a way that, you know, resonates with them. So being the voice of the consumer um, for change, for positive change and being the voice for employees that's, I would say 90% of my job. Yeah. Right. I'm going to ask a couple questions about your journey because the students love hearing about this. Yeah. And I'll open it up for questions. So if you guys, audience, if you have questions, feel free to put it in the chat and then we'll go through those. Um, so what was your first job out of graduation? I think you mentioned it was on semiconductor. Was that the first? Yeah, I was interning at McMurray. Um, and so I got hired on as a permanent role there inside. They had a really small PR team there. Um, I very quickly learned that working at an agency um, wasn't for me. Pretending to know everything about five different brands 
um, and doing all that coordination and administration work that you talked about at the beginning, it was really hard. I just can't, I, I couldn't, I couldn't be that, you know, I couldn't divide my attention enough and bill, billing time every 15 minutes became, you know, a chore. So I went in house really early on. Um, and so it was on semiconductor and, um, I think, you know, I, I, I interviewed for that job. I was 21. I didn't even know what a semiconductor was or what they did. Um, but I saw a communication specialist job role. And to be honest, Lisa, it was probably the fifth or sixth job interview um, that I had gotten that I, um, I had been turned down by Honeywell and all these other big brands. And I went into that interview with on semiconductor, just kind of assuming I'll do it for experience, but I'm probably not going to get this one either. Um, and I think you and I talked about this. I went into my Honeywell interview and I had, you know, the right business suit on and I had my hair pulled up into a low bun and I took my pink nail polish off and I painted my nails nude and I, I looked the part. Um, I did all my research. I could like, you know, regurgitate their vision statement and everything they had on their website. And I, I didn't get the job. So um, the night before my interview at on semiconductor, I laid out, you know, a pink button up and a black blazer. I wore my hair down, whatever nail polish I had on, I left on and I went in and I was just genuinely who I am um, and said, you know, I'm not, I don't fully understand what your business does, but I'm a really great storyteller. I'm a fast learner and I'm a great writer. And I think I'd be a good asset. And crazily enough, I got hired. <laughs> And my boss took a chance on me and, um, you know, it was the best first job, I think, in-house. I immediately started supporting, you know, CEOs and executives. And I went into it thinking, hey, they put their pants on one leg at a time, just like I do. And I'm here to serve. Um, and I think that really having that kind of mindset really set me up for success in a way that I probably couldn't have really articulated back then. Well, and our students will ask, like, what, you, what do you wear to an interview? You know, what do you, and I always say the best thing you can wear is confidence. Go yeah. in wearing whatever makes you feel really confident while still being professional and polished, um, but walk in there confidently selling your story, your personal brand, which is a whole nother thing we could talk it's about um, and have a, a nice little discussion about, but it's really about representing your personal brand and having your case studies ready to present, you know, everything you learned in school and in your internship. So I love that you touched on that as well. Yep. Um, what do you recall during your interview process? Is there anything that you could lend advice to our students that you learned, you know, maybe the hard way, maybe, you know, just, it's a, maybe just a piece of advice as they enter um, the world of internships and their full-time jobs, what advice would you give them about interviewing? Yeah, and I think when you go through the interview process, you're going to have multiple layers. So you're going to get screened by an HR professional and they nine times out of 10 have very standard questions that they're going to ask you. Um, they, they likely don't know very much about what you'll actually do and the duties you'll actually perform at the organization. No fault to HR professionals, but they are trying to hire and fill a lot of different roles. They don't understand the nuances of every department. Um, they're really screening you. So they'll ask you, you know, what are your weaknesses? What are your strengths? And I think having very general um, ideas and answers to some of those more, um, you know, formulaic questions are good. I wouldn't stress about those because what I think they're really trying to feel out is if you're just kind of a culture fit. I found that in most interviews, they're really trying to identify, you know, how would we work together? Are you someone who I can easily talk to? Um, do you perceive, you know, to be, you know, somewhat uh, intelligent enough to be able to pick up some of this? I don't think anyone's expecting you to understand how that organization operates. Um, they're going to expect you to have good questions around how the organization operates. How does communications fit in? How do they value communications? Because I think when I was interviewing back, you know, 14 years ago for my first job, I didn't consider it as me interviewing them as somewhere I wanted to spend 40 hours a week. I was begging them to hire me, right? Um, and I think today it's a lot different because you have the internet, you can go on Glassdoor, you can find more information about an organization before you even interview there. 
But then once you get through the HR layer, you're going to be talking to someone within the communications sphere or department, someone who knows what you'll be doing. Um, and they're really going to know, hey, do you bring the skills to the table? Everything else can be taught. I can teach you the organization. I can teach you the voice. I can teach you the language. Um, you know, it's the soft skills on how are you going to function as part of the team? And do you have the basic skill sets that are necessary to be able to to perform the job. So I think finding ways to highlight um, your writing. You know, for me, when we're hiring anyone on our communications team, it's what kind of writer are they? Are they adaptable? Um, do they have different styles of writing? You know, can they write for the intranet one way and then can they also, you know, adapt and write for an executive? Um, and then, you know, how will they, and we're gauging how, how would they fit in on the team, right? Because our team, there's not one thing that, you know, one person writes and doesn't go through an editing process where other people see it. So um, not being so self-serving, I guess, or being so, you know, here's what I can do. It's here's how I can contribute to the team and the, the broader team success um, would be kind of the advice I give. And to really just be yourself um, because if they don't want you for who you are, then you wouldn't want to work there anyways. Yeah. And I think when I let myself finally be myself, you know, I was able to connect with the hiring manager and he was probably one of the best bosses I've ever had. And I feel I would have been extremely unhappy in any of the other places that I had interviewed before because I really tried to be someone I wasn't. That's great advice. Thank you, Stephanie. We have about 10 minutes left, so I'm going to turn it over to some of the student questions. Um, the first one is from Garrett. How do you manage the stress that comes with crisis communications? The Peloton or <laughs> exercise is good for stress relief, but what, what other is. recommendations? Um, to be honest, deep breaths, sleep. I'm not someone who can operate on, you know, a few hours of sleep. So I sleep is my self-care. Um, over time though, with crisis, you'll learn that, you know, you have to be the calm collector because if you're not calm you know you're sending this kind of energy out to others especially if you're dealing with the media if you're just dealing with executives internally you know I think it's a little bit more around the company culture but when you're dealing with the media you've got to be as calm and cool as and collected as you can be and that comes with I think experience um, and confidence um, and knowing that you know the answers and you you know you're really the, the keeper of that message. And you're going to have that message fine-tuned and refined before you'd be delivering it to anyone. So it's not really off the cuff, hopefully. Um, you're going to have some input from most of the important stakeholders internally. But it's it's really deep breath, deep breaths, and a lot of venting to loved ones because it's a, it's, it's a lot of work. Um, and you're really corralling a lot of people because you're managing the crisis. You're trying to kind of percolate all the ideas while you're putting your plan together, getting that plan somewhat approved while you're starting your drafts and then managing all, you know, the touch points in between. So it's a lot. I think learning to be kind of a, a multitasker and get inputs from multiple different sources um, is helpful in kind of learning and, and crafting that skill. Great answer. Um, the next is from Stefano. How would you suggest rising journalists reconcile their own personal brands um, composed of non-negotiable stances influenced by socio-cultural events, movements, human rights issues with traditional notions of ob objectivity still prevalent in the field? So, you know, how we were taught unbiased, objective news reporting, but social media adds a, a whole nother layer to that in that you're to be social and talk about your personal passions and views, but you're also representing your brand, your brand but you're also representing um, journalism. Have you had to manage that at all or what advice might you give? Yeah, and this is a really, really hard one, Lisa, because I think this is kind of developing right now um, mm -hmm. because social media didn't exist you know, it really wasn't that long ago where people didn't have to worry about this. But I think that's why you'll see brands or um, executives or even celebrities, you know, my views are my own. They have a dedicated personal, how do you create your own personal brand versus when you're representing a brand? You do, you have to be unbiased. You have to be professional. 
you have to keep those feelings kind of out of it um, in order to be successful, right? Because that is part of a journalist's job is to report, you know, the facts from an unbiased place. I think if it's something that is, you know, very rooted in who you are, I think you're going to have a lot of self-conflict or internal conflict. Um, but I think, you know, from just an everyday, you know, working for a CEO who is, you know, has different values or different beliefs than you do, if you're their writer, you know, I think you'll learn very early on that that's going to be really hard for you. Um, so, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't shy away from your values. I think you should stay true to who you are, depending on the role you're playing in journalism. If you're a reporter, um, I think it's much more difficult, but much more um, important that you're playing that unbiased um, role. When it comes to being inside of an organization, that's a question. I've known many, many people who have kind of opted out of an organization because yeah. their stance didn't align with their own internal values. And I think that's okay. And I think it's very big of you if you come to that, that conclusion. Um, but it's hard. That's a, that's a really very personal um, question that I think only that individual would be able to answer for themselves. The next question is from Kiara. Uh, for companies that are self-declared yes companies that are choosing customers over employees, what advice would you give to upper management as their employees lose faith in the brand and the company? Oh, that's an interesting question too. Yeah, I think I, here's the where the rubber meets the road, right? Every company has multiple, especially if they're a public company. Um, they have they are created to create value for shareholders. That's why they exist, right? Is to create generate returns, and in the process, hopefully, they can do that while being um, great to their employees, deliver a great customer experience. Um, but the message that executives send internally, right? There's all the, all the books out there that say, you know, you can't not communicate. You just can't. By not sending a message, you're sending a message. And there is nothing more true than that. And so if you're an executive and you get on an all employee call and all you talk about is financials, you're sending a message to the employee population that all you care about is, is numbers and you get those financials at any cost. Um, a perfect example, I think for this one is um, home building in my world. Um, we have a very rushed end of the year, right? We give guidance to Wall Street and we say how many homes we're gonna deliver in a given year. So say it's 15,000 homes. We deliver a lot of homes around Christmas time. You know, building takes, you know, six to eight months. We do everything we can to get it done in that fiscal year so it can count towards that guidance that we gave Wall Street. That's how they depend our stock price. Everything depends on it. But we have created um, a non-negotiable that we will not deliver a not completed home, right? And so whether that means it can't close on December 31st or it rolls into the next year, we will not deliver a home if it's not complete. And so that message says we care more about our customers coming into their home on Christmas, that they have a home that has, you know, countertops and toilets and flooring, and it's ready to be lived in more than we care about, you know, delivering on financials. Now, hopefully you can find a medium where you, 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 you've worked through the process to where you can get, you know ahead of time if you're not gonna be able to finish that home. So you can, you can re-guide to your year. Um, but companies, I think to answer the question, if they're just a yes company and they're choosing um, customers or financials over the employees, I mean, that will eventually come to bite them in the butt. Um, I really do believe, because I think talent and good people and good work ethic and people who are there to take care of your customers, you don't exist if you don't have that. Um, so my advice would be um, to continue to use your voice, to continue to find ways to communicate what you're seeing to upper management, because my guess would be that they're not seeing it, they're too far removed. Mm -hmm. I've found in a lot of different organizations, there's a lot of layers executives are ultimately like 10 times removed from the actual customer experience. Um, and they're more worried about, you know, what is the story that they have to tell Wall Street versus, you know, interacting with customers every day. 
So hopefully you'll work at a place where you've got executives that you see on the front line, talking to employees every day, talking about the issues that face their organization so that you can get to the root of that. Because I think ultimately that's not a good recipe for uh, that organization's success. Yeah. All right. So last question, and you touched on it a little bit, but how does the industry look for strategic communications professionals? Because sometimes my students will say, I just know there's no interns or internships or jobs out there. And I'm like, oh, don't believe what you're hearing from whoever it is that's saying it, because mm -hmm. there are a lot of great jobs out there and internships right now. I think actually there's a little bit of a boom. Yes. So what are you seeing, Stephanie, for the industry and those who want to maybe go into it? I would agree that there's a boom. And if you're not really seeing it or feeling it, wait till the holidays pass and you're certainly gonna feel it. I know a lot of companies will kind of wait knowing that interviewing during the holidays can be um, hard. Um, we just hired an, an intern um, a few months ago um, because we needed additional help. Um, I think even next year, we've got three or four new positions coming onto our team. I think right now with every company kind of rethinking about how they need to communicate with employees, the workforce makeup is changing um, and they're gonna need communication professionals to help them through that, guide them through that. Consumer behavior and preferences and values are changing and marketing professionals are gonna have to think about brand communications completely differently. You know, we didn't really talk about um, ESG social um, governance, like how, that's how employees are, organizations are rated, right? How they show up in this um, social responsibility world. Um, a lot of that's table, table stakes now. It's just something you have to do in order to be um, relevant. So I think, I think it's, I, I truly believe this. It's, there's never a better time to get into communications. Cause like I said, it's all changing. The world's completely changing around you and you get to tell that story. And I think at the end of the day, the biggest skill set you can bring into an organization is finding incredible stories and telling them in a way that will relate to other employees and make them feel. You know, we have um, an internet and we, we, we post one to two stories a day. And the comments we get are, oh my gosh, you know, people are waking up in the morning, engaging with our, our internet and they're crying. They're, they're, they're emotionally touched by the people that work with them in our organizations, telling stories about their life and people, your colleagues that you just don't know about. All that creates culture and all that creates like emotional connection to the brand that you work for and the brand you represent. So being able to do that as a skill set that I promise you is so needed in corporate America and forever will be. Forever. Thank you so much, Stephanie. It has been yeah. a pleasure chatting with you and you too and learning more about Taylor Morrison and, and you as well. So thank you so much oh, and thank you all for attending. And you got a couple thank yous in the chat as well. Oh, so um, sweet. Yeah, so thank you all for joining as well. And if there are any openings, Stephanie, for coordinators or specialists, or you know where to come. I sure do. This will be my first place to stop. <laughs> all right, thank you, Stephanie. Thank you. Have a great, Have a great Monday. Monday.